audience, welcome. I'm Mariangela Pellegrini. I work for DRN Eurobonnet as Patients Program Manager. And it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of DRN. Uh, as you may know, today um, we have a lecture that is part of a cycle of webinars dedicated to sickle cell disease and address to patients and their family, whose aim is to uh, disseminate educational topics among the sickle cell disease community, so to patients and their families. And um, one important thing to say is that uh, we have identified 11 topics, and those topics have been chosen directly by people living with sickle cell disease from answering to a survey. So today we are at the sixth uh, lecture. We have already um, tackled many topics. Today we are going to talk. Um, we are going to talk about sickle cell disease and immune disease. With us, uh, we have, as usual, an expert of this domain. Um, I'm very glad to introduce you, Dr. Sliman Alali, and I hope to pronounce it properly. He's uh, head of the Reference Center for Red, Red Cell Disease and Sickle Cell Center and the Necker University Hospital in Paris, in France which follows 700 children um, and is also head of a healthcare network for sickle cell children in the Parisian area. And so it's my great pleasure to pass the floor to you, Dr. Alali. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So thank you for the introduction. My, my name is Simon Alali. I'm a pediatrician. Um, in the general pediatric and in the sickle cell center of Neca Hospital in Paris. And I also work for the research in the laboratory of molecular mechanisms of hematologic disorders and therapeutic implication in the Imagine Institute in the laboratory of Professor Olivier Amin uh, in Paris uh, on uh, innate immunity and uh, sickle cell disease. So I'm very glad to discuss with you today the the theme of sickle cell disease and autoimmune diseases. I have no conflict of interest to declare. Um, I will go on quickly. So the learning objectives uh, today are, can be uh, summarized in three questions. Um, the first one is how could sickle cell disease promote autoimmunity? Uh, the second one is are patients with sickle cell disease more prone to autoimmune diseases? And the last one is what are the therapeutic implications of autoimmunity in sickle cell disease? So let's start with the, the first point. Um, the definition of autoimmunity can be defined uh, as immune uh, response leading to uh, a reaction against uh, a self antigen that is a molecule that is a normal constitu constituent uh, of uh, the body. So, uh, autoimmune diseases, they occur when immunity fails to control uh, a subset of lymphocytes, which are autoreactive lymphocytes that become responsible for damages of tissues uh, containing the autoantigen. So if, if we look here at cells uh, from the body, we can see the, the red triangle. It's a self antigen, that is a molecule uh, <clears throat> that belongs to the body of the patient. Here we have um, an element of the environment an infectious agent, for instance, and uh, there's also an antigen uh, with uh, similarity um, with uh, the, the self antigen on the cell. Okay, uh, and now we have a white blood cell, lymphocyte, that will recognize uh, this uh, antigen, uh, which is normal, but the problem is that it will also mistakenly recognize the self antigen, so it will uh, the lymphocyte will produce antibodies that will uh, target the cell antigen, resulting in the end in uh, production of mediators, cytokines, and mediators that will uh, damage the tissue, damage the cells. So that's the principle of uh, autoimmunity. And um, the breaking of uh, peripheral tolerance, the, the, this mechanism that we have seen, may be caused by several uh, mechanisms. The, the first one 
um, if molecular mimicry is just the fact that there are similarities between some antigens uh, on the cells of the patient and some antigens on uh, elements of the environment, such as infectious agents. Uh, but it's not all. We have also uh, different um, factors that would promote autoimmunity, including inflammation, abnormal leukocytes, abnormal cytokines, uh, the, the inflammatory mediators, abnormal complements. Uh, complements is uh, a set of uh, small proteins that activate themselves uh, in a cascade, resulting in a um, uh, uh, a kind of complex that will attack uh, the cell membrane of the, the pathogens, or should do so. And also, uh, type 1 interferon is um, produced and the sustained production of type 1 interferon, which is a um, cytokine, a mediator uh, that promotes, that uh, plays an important role in immunoregulation and um, uh, T cell um, proliferation. This Type 1 interferon, uh, when it's produced too much, it also plays a role in autoimmunity. And why is it important? Uh, just because we will see later that all these parameters are increased in, in patients with sickle cell disease. Inflammation, abnormal leukocytes, cytokines, inflammation, complement activation, type 1 interferon, all these uh, characteristics are uh, uh, upregulated, are uh, important in sickle cell disease. So in autoimmune diseases, there's also um, an importance of genotypes, some specific genotypes, uh, HLA, B27, for instance, uh, may predispose to autoimmune diseases, but it's not really the problem in sickle cell disease, which is linked to a single uh, mutation of the beta globin gene. Uh, the important thing is that uh, the main triggers of autoimmune diseases are infection, and we know the role of infection in sickle cell disease and the importance of infection. Uh, and the, the increased susceptibility to infection. So um, now let's have a look at the, the classical pathophysiology of sickle cell disease that you all know, but it's still interesting to, to say that, that the, the sickle cell disease is primarily a disease of the red blood cell uh, with the single uh, mutation of the beta globin gene that will result in the polymerization of hemoglobin tetramers in hypoxic condition that will form long fibers that deform the red blood cell into a sickle, resulting in two phenomena, vasoocclusion and chronic hemolysis. So uh, that is the classical pathophysiology and it's very important. But in the last years, there has been uh, growing evidence um, on a role for other cells than the red blood cells, that is uh, the innate immune cells. So the red blood cell still, uh, still keeps a, a central place uh, in the pathophysiology with the cyclin uh, increased adhesion to the endothelium. Uh, but through uh, the, the release of heme, the red blood cell, the yeah, hemolysis, can also activate many different innate immune cells, including the monocytes, which are uh, leukocytes that produce huge amounts of inflammatory mediators, such as TNF alpha or interleukin 1 beta, that will in turn activate endothelial cells and activate the endothelium leading to adhesion molecules. These um, monocytes, they can also play a positive role when they scavenge cellular debris from the endothelium. You have outside the blood vessels, you have macrophages. Macrophages are like monocytes, they are huge producers of inflammatory mediators. And they can be activated via the same receptor, CLA4, uh, which is expressed by almost all innate immune cells actually and they contribute to the production of inflammatory mediators and also to the recruitment of monocytes to tissues. Neutral fields are major actors of adhesion of the red blood cell to the uh, endothelium, and they also promote uh, vasoocclusion. Uh, there's a release of a DNA uh, fiber that are called uh, neutrophil extracellular traps. So all these cells are very important, but they are not the only one. We have also the platelets, that are activated in sickle cell disease via TLR4 as well, that can also contribute to inflammation. We have the release of mediators. We have other subset of uh, more uh, rare uh, lymphocytes or white blood cells, such as uh, 
the invariant metro uh, killer T cells that produce interferon gamma. We have eosinophils that are activated and produce reactive oxygen species. And uh, last but not least, we have the mast cell, which is uh, an important actor for which we have a particular interest in the laboratory. Uh, and who release many different mediators and seems to uh, play a role of orchestrator in this complex set of uh, innate immunity. So uh, sickle cell disease is not a disease of the red blood cell only. And uh, the red blood cell is not, is not the only protagonist uh, anymore. Uh, we, we see that innate immune cells play a very important role. So it leads to the question, how could sickle cell disease promote autoimmunity? Uh, first, we have seen that all innate immune cells are important and they are increased in absolute count in sickle cell disease. Um, almost all cells are increased. Uh, and the monocyte, um, monocyte disease, so the monocyte count is correlated to hemolysis markers, for instance. Also, all these cells, they have the TLR4 receptor that we have been talking about, and chronic hemolysis uh, can activate all these cells in sickle cell disease. As it has been well demonstrated by John Belcher, hemoglobin will release him. Him will activate this TLR4 receptor, which will lead in the activation of these uh, inflammatory pathways resulting in inflammatory mediators. And it will also um, contribute to the overexpression of adhesion molecules, such as P-selectin, and we know the importance of P-selectin, uh, which is a, a target for new treatments such as uh, crisanlizumab. So that's uh, an important point, but that's not all. The complement pathway that we have been talking uh, earlier, this uh, set of uh, small proteins that activate themselves in a cascade, uh, this complement pathway is hyperactivated in patients with sickle cell disease. And this is true even in steady state. Uh, we, here we, it's a, a, a work that was published recently on uh, soluble C5B9. That the name is not important. It's just that it's a, a marker of the uh, terminal um, complement pathway activation. And this marker of the complement activation is increased in patients with sickle cell disease compared to uh, healthy controlled, Caucasian or uh, African controls. We have an increased um, plasma levels of these uh, markers. And an interesting point is that here you have uh, controls, here you have patients non-treated with hydroxyurea, and here you have patients treated with hydroxyurea, and you can see that the complement um, level, so the complement activation level is um, low is, is lower uh, when the patient receives hydroxyurea. So it might be um, reflecting a beneficial uh, effect of hydroxyurea, as we will discuss later. And uh, the last point uh, is the interferon alpha um, uh, signaling pathway. Um, this interferon alpha signaling pathway is very important in autoimmunity. It's uh, um, a discovery of this uh, 10, new, 10 last years. And we have seen that in the, in the plasma uh, from patients with sickle cell disease, the level is uh, significantly increased compared to LC control. Um, and when we look at all the genes that could be upregulated in monocytes uh, in response to this activation of the interferon alpha pathway, we look at monocyte from patients with sickle cell disease and we see that all these genes are upregulated, are overexpressed compared to control. So this pathway, which is very important in autoimmunity, is also uh, very important in patients with sickle cell disease. Here we have a, um, a, a, what we call a transcriptome. It's the mRNA expression. So it's the expression of all the genes in the monocytes in these inflammatory uh, cells from patients with sickle cell disease. And you can see that for sickle cell disease, uh, the color are not the same because all these genes are upregulated compared to controls, but also compared to other um, diseases, other patients with um, hemolytic uh, anemias that are different from sickle cell disease. So it's not just hemolysis actually that uh, is responsible for this um, pathway and active inflammation probably also plays a very important role. So, um, now that we have uh, discussed a little bit about uh, the pathophysiology and how 
uh, sickle cell disease could promote autoimmunity. The second point is, um, is this one, are patients uh, with sickle cell disease more prone to autoimmune diseases? So autoimmune diseases, first of all, it's, um, it can be considered as multi-organ systemic diseases, uh, where the immune system will mistakenly recognize uh, antigens from the body as foreign uh, antigens and will react and will attack uh, the tissues. But the important point is that all tissues can be affected. It's really a multi-organ disease. And it's quite um, important to say that sickle cell disease is also a multi-organ disease that can affect different organs, including the brain, the eyes, uh, the bone, the lungs, liver, and so on. So uh, this, there is quite a parallel between this um, autoimmune diseases and sickle cell disease. So autoimmune diseases um, are quite complex. They can be classified, if we want to make it simple, um, in organ-specific autoimmune diseases or systemic diseases. So organ-specific can be, for instance, specific of uh, the liver for uh, primary biliary cirrhosis, for instance, or autoimmune hepatitis, uh, which is not rare in patients with sickle cell disease, as uh, inflammatory bowel diseases, such as Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, um, which are diseases specific of the, uh, of the bowel. But uh, we have also what we call systemic diseases um, that are autoimmune diseases where the antigen is not specifically in an organ, but is in different organs, different tissues. And uh, the two main uh, diseases um, in this category are systemic lupus erythematosus and rheumatoid arthritis. So let, let's have a, um, let's discuss a little bit about these two uh, diseases because they are the, the most frequently reported uh, autoimmune diseases in sickle cell disease. So systemic lupus erythematosus, it's a, a very frequent, a frequent autoimmune disease, a disease, sorry, that affects several organs, as we can see in this uh, picture, including the joints, the skin, the brain, lungs, kidneys, uh, blood vessels, so many organs can be uh, affected um, through, through the vessel, actually. Uh, it can affect people of all age, but it, the, the risk is greater in women of childbearing age or so young women. The symptoms are very varied and non-specific, which may be a problem uh, in patients with sickle cell disease because uh, non-specific symptoms are also common in patients with uh, sickle cell disease. And they include fatigue, fever, pain, swelling of the joints, skin rashes, photosensitivity, uh, mouth ulcers, and uh, lung and heart uh, abnormalities, uh, such as uh, pleuritis or uh, pericarditis. And as in many diseases, um, an early diagnosis and early treatment initiation will help reduce damaging the effect of the disease and will improve uh, the, the quality of what the evolution and the quality of life. Now, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, it's, it's a different disease, but uh, it's actually quite similar by some point because it's, uh, it's frequent, it's even more frequent than lupus, it's a very frequent autoimmune disease. It primarily affects the joints, but it may also affect the skin, the eyes, the lungs, heart, and other uh, tissues. So the joint is very, very important and the synovial um, is very important. There is huge inflammation in the synovial that will, in the end, destroy the, the joint and, and result in stiffness and um, uh, deformation. So this uh, disease, this autoimmune disease, affects people of 50 years of age in median with a greater risk in women. The most frequent symptoms include symptoms of the joints, so the pain, the swelling, stiffness, and deformation of the joint. But there are also symptoms of the skin for rheumatoid nodules of the eyes, for scleritis, for instance, lungs with interstitial lung disease, fatigue, depression, and many other symptoms can be found in this disease. And the anti-inflammatory treatments, like in uh, lupus, have to be uh, started early to improve symptoms and to slow the disease progression um, as soon as possible. Now, 
um, what do we know about autoimmune diseases and patients with sickle cell disease? In the literature, the main autoimmune diseases that have been reported are the two that we have uh, briefly shown, systemic lupus erythematosus and rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and there's a, a, a very good review from a, a big team in the British Journal of Hematology that, uh, that summarizes uh, these two uh, diseases. An important point is that um, there are really overlapping symptoms between these two diseases and uh, sickle cell disease because they, are, they, are, they both are uh, systemic uh, diseases with uh, non-specific symptoms. So the diagnosis may be sometimes very difficult uh, as pain of the joint or the muscle, fever, elevated inflammatory markers are common in diseases, in these autoimmune diseases, but also common in sickle cell disease. So it's very important uh, that the doctor, when the, the pain is persistent, or is uh, particularly uh, important or recurrent or that there are some um, atypical uh, symptoms, it's very important to look for specific symptoms of autoimmune diseases and not to always conclude that the pain is uh, related to sickle cell disease. Otherwise, uh, there, there will be a diagnosis delay for these autoimmune diseases, which can be uh, uh, negative for the patient. So, uh, it's important, for instance, for lupus to look at uh, malar rash, alopecia, with hair loss, photosensitivity, it's a reaction to sun, oral ulcers, pericarditis, pruritus, to look at all these symptoms. Here you have a, a, a young woman with um, a, a malar rash, it's a, what we call a butterfly rash, which she has, is not supposed to be seen in sickle cell disease. Here you have a, a man with hair loss, it's alopecia, which is quite uh, suggestive of uh, lupus. And here you have a, a young girl uh, with a uh, photosensitive uh, dermatitis of the neck. So this is very important um, to avoid diagnosis delay as it has been well shown by uh, our colleagues. Now, systemic lupus and sickle cell disease, what do we know? We know that the, the prevalence in the general population is one case out of 1,000. In sickle, cell, in, in sickle cell disease, the prevalence is not perfectly well known, but it's clearly increased as um, in the literature, we have a prevalence from three to 14 cases per 1,000 patients. So it's, it's clearly increased. Um, the problem is that the criteria, the revised European criteria for, for lupus uh, that have been published in 2018, uh, 19, sorry, and that are very good for the general population cannot be used um, for patients with sickle cell disease because a lot of these criteria, such as fever, joint involvement, uh, cytopenia, uh, the low white blood cell level, the low platelets level, are very frequent in patients with sickle cell disease. And uh, for biological markers, it's, uh, it's the same because uh, anti-nuclear antibodies, which are um, antibodies that we look for uh, in lepers and that are quite important in the diagnosis, they are elevated in 50% of patients with sickle cell disease. So we can clearly not uh, rely on these markers and we have to look directly at more specific markers such as anti-DNA or uh, anti-SMIS uh, antibodies. Now, rheumatoid arthritis and sickle cell disease. What is known, we know that the incidence uh, it's a very frequent disease, and the incidence is one out of uh, 100 patients, 1% 1 of the pop general population uh, has rheumatoid arthritis. It occurs, uh, we have said, at uh, 50, age, um, 50 years of age in the general population. It's the same incidence in patients with sickle cell disease, but it occurs at a younger age. So clearly, uh, there seems to be a, a, an over risk in uh, sickle cell disease because it occurs at least five years earlier than in the general population. And the suspected mechanisms, uh, apart, um, apart from uh, the, the classical autoimmune uh, diseases mechanism that we have been talking about, the suspected mechanisms in sickle cell disease uh, involve ischemia of the, the joint, synovial ischemia that will result in inflammation and complement activation that increases autoimmunity. Here again, the diagnosis may be difficult because persistent joint pain and biological inflammation is very frequent 
in uh, sickle cell disease. So we have to use uh, biological markers such as rheumatoid factors and uh, uh, X-ray uh, to help distinguish between uh, the, the two diagnoses. Um, X-ray because uh, actually the, the, it can show erosion of the, the joints uh, of the small uh, joint and the, the, the large joint as well, but it's uh, often symmetric um, uh, damage of the joint and that are not typical on the X-ray of what we can see uh, in sickle cell disease uh, bone. But all these markers have to be done if the diagnosis has been evoked and the first thing is uh, already to evoke the diagnosis when the pains or the, 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 the joint pain, stiffness and swelling is not really usual or is very important. Um, now what about other autoimmune diseases in sickle cell disease. We have been talking about organ specific, uh, sorry, about systemic uh, autoimmune diseases, but there are also organ specific autoimmune diseases, such as uh, the autoimmune liver diseases, um, which are not as rare as we, we thought in patients with sickle cell disease. Here it's a, um, a publication uh, from our court patient, and uh, we have been looking at all the, the liver. Um, abnormalities uh, in our patient, and we found that autoimmune hepatitis is represent um, five, zero, uh, 0 0.5% of uh, the patient. So it's not as rare as it should be. Um, but the problem is that there are many other causes of liver abnormalities in sickle cell disease, uh, lithiasis, of course, but we can have also uh, ischemic cholangiopathy. Um, we also have uh, vaso occlusion because as you can see here, the, the red blood cell, when there is a sickling, it can also obstruct the small vessels of the, of the, of the liver and results in biological abnormalities. Uh, we have the transfusion with iron overload that can result in problem of the, the liver. Uh, and we have also the problem with the chelator treatment, treatment um, that can have toxicity for the liver sometimes, uh, infectious hepatitis, and even biochemical abnormality without uh, explanation in more than 2% of patients, and that probably reflects uh, uh, vaso occlusion uh, at steady state. So it's very difficult to uh, evoke the diagnosis of autoimmune liver disease, but it should be done when uh, there is a, a, a persistent uh, biological uh, abnormalities. And um, it's important to look at autoantibodies that are specific of uh, the liver. I have not detailed them because it's not uh, the point here, but uh, it's important to evoke the diagnosis and look for it with specific markers and when necessary to look at uh, histology on liver biopsy uh, when necessary. Now, two other uh, autoimmune diseases. Um, red blood cell autoantibodies, it's not really uh, a, an autoimmune disease because it's not always responsible for hemolytic autoimmune anemia, but it's important to know that um, almost 8% of transfused patients uh, have autoantibodies, that is uh, antibodies directed against the red blood cells from the patient. And this is a major risk factor for autoimmunization. So when a patient has autoantibodies, the risk is tenfold higher to develop uh, antibodies against uh, the red blood cell from uh, a blood donor during a transfusion. So it's very important to look at it, and it's a reflex of autoimmunity in patients with sickle cell disease. Now, another disease that is very uh, frequent in the general population, diabetes. Uh, it's a very interesting um, uh, uh, wrong example of autoimmunity uh, in a sickle cell disease because Diabetes is frequent in the general population. It's uh, uh, one patient out of uh, one uh, one thousand, uh, but the, the 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 prevalence in um, in sickle cell disease is clearly lower than in the general population. And we know we don't know clearly uh, the, the 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 reason. We think that there is a role for uh, a lower obesity rate uh, because patients with sickle cell disease are less uh, less obesity problem than than in the general population uh, because of hypermetabolism and dysbiosis and so on. 
but it's not it, it might be also reflecting other pathways that we are investigating um now just a, a small uh, work that we we have done in our cohort of patients on autoimmune diseases in patients with sickle cell disease uh, it's unpublished but you can see here that in our cohort of uh, 700 patients we have looked at uh, the prevalence of these different uh, autoimmune diseases and you see that in black it's the prevalence in the general population in children and in red it's the prevalence in uh, our cohort and uh, what do we have uh, we have a very increased prevalence in our cohort for lupus kikushi which is kind of lupus with uh, lymph nodes and uh, specific histology we have uh, increased uh, prevalence of autoimmune liver disease inflammatory bowel disease um, and anemia uh, uh, and uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia so the only uh, uh, disease that is not increased is uh, diabetes uh, mellitus, as we have uh, discussed earlier. Now we arrive at the, the third point of this uh, of this talk. Um, the the third, third, third question is: What are the therapeutic implications of autoimmunity in sickle cell disease? Um, first, what are the main treatment of autoimmune disease uh, outside of the, the context of sickle cell disease? Glucocorticoids are the most frequently used initial anti-inflammatory drugs in autoimmune diseases. So at the initial phase of almost all autoimmune diseases, uh, the corticoids, which are very powerful uh, anti-inflammatory treatments, not very uh, subtle, but very powerful, um, can be used and can be efficient. The problem is that they're exposed to many adverse effects, including hypercortism, adrenal suppression, hypoglycemia, the diabetes, uh, dyslipidemia, uh, heart problem, osteoporosis, and, and so on. So it's very important that during chronic treatment of autoimmune diseases, uh, the doctor has to try to minimize and to taper and discontinuate when possible uh, this um, glucocorticoid treatment. And to do so, we have to use immunomodulatory agents uh, or biological therapies that uh, will help uh, to stop the, the corticoid as a uh, result. Now, what about um, steroids, glucocorticoids in sickle cell disease? Um, in sickle cell disease, we know that steroids are not um, are not easy to use. Why? Because they are responsible for leukocyte demargination. Leukocyte demargination: the fact that the white blood cells go out, uh, go in the, the vessel uh, from the, the endosome to the vessel. So why is it a problem? It's a problem because the red blood cell uh, in the vessel, we, through hemolysis, will release heme. Heme will activate TLA4. TLA4 will activate the P-selectin. The P-selectin will um, fix, uh, will um, stack the, the neutrophil. The neutrophil will get um, attached to the P-selectin, which is an adhesion uh, protein. And then there will be a secondary, secondary wave of activating signals through E-selectin that will induce the clustering of a molecule that is called MAC1 on the leading edge of the neutrophil that will capture uh, the red blood cells. And this is responsible for vasoocclusion. This is a very important mechanism of vasoocclusion. So steroids, when they induce leukocyte demargination, they can contribute to vasoocclusion and uh, as a crisis in HS syndrome. And this has been well demonstrated in this uh, publication, uh, recent publication in blood by uh, Walter and, uh, and, and all. And now um, steroids and autoimmune diseases in sickle cell disease, there have all, there has also been several reports showing that there is an increased incidence of vasoclue crisis in HS syndrome when autoimmune diseases are treated with steroids in a sickle cell disease context. So many teams uh, think that it's important to prevent this risk uh, related to steroids by using the transfusion or exchange transfusion program, uh, at least when the steroids that are high uh, dosages, in order to prevent uh, the uh, occurrence of this uh, very severe complication. And the, the idea is to decrease the level of uh, hemoglobin S in order to prevent the risk of vasoclusion. So uh, what about, about other therapies for autoimmune diseases and sickle cell disease? 
we have seen the steroids. Uh, the other therapies are immunomodulators, such as mesotrexate for uh, rheumatoid arthritis, for instance, or azathioprine, and uh, biological agents such as anti TNF alpha antibodies, infliximab, or other, uh, that are modulating the inflammation and that are very good treatment, new treatment, but they expose to an increased risk of infection. And we know that uh, in sickle cell disease, there is already an increased susceptibility to infection due to um, functional aspenia. So it's very important when these treatments are used to, um, to look at the vaccination and to do it properly, and also to give the advice of uh, immediate consultation in case of signs of infection, such as fever or cough or so on. Uh, other treatment, mesotrexate and other disease-modifying anti-rheumatoid drugs are at increased risk of cytopenia, so it's important to know it. And all the, the, the specific risk on the liver, the kidney, and so on, that are specific to each molecule have to be known uh, in order to, to prevent the occurrence and not to say that uh, the problem is linked to sickle cell disease when introduced. But Overall, these uh, therapies, these new therapies, have excellent tolerance. And in this publication from uh, Medicare Hospital, we had very good results with uh, anti TNF alpha uh, treatment in several patients with autoimmune diseases. Uh, now I'm almost finished, but I would like to, to say a word on treatments of sickle cell disease in the context of autoimmune diseases, because hydroxyurea is clearly not the treatment a treatment uh, uh, that we will use for autoimmune diseases, but it will clearly reduce autoimmunity because it decreases innate immune cell count and it decreases antibody production. It's also one of the, the effects that is looked for because uh, we know that the patient with the, the most um, uh, benefit effects of hydroxyurea, uh, of course, they have increased in fetal hemoglobin, but they have also uh, a decrease in uh, neutrophil or leukocyte absolute count. And uh, this is very important because it can also decrease innate immune cells and autoimmunity. Hemasopoietic stem cell transplantation is, is clearly a treatment that can cure sickle cell disease, but it's important to say that it can also cure autoimmune disease, diseases because the bone marrow will be replaced by the bone marrow from the donor, and uh, the bone marrow from the donor uh, has not the same um, susceptibility to autoimmunity. So, uh, we have an uh, example of patients uh, with autoimmune diseases who had uh, bone marrow transplantation and who uh, were um, uh, completely cured of their autoimmune diseases after the treatment, even if this treatment was not decided for this indication. And there is uh, also a risk of recurrence of autoimmune uh, diseases, for instance, autoimmune hepatitis, if Transplantation, liver transplantation is performed for patients with autoimmune hepatitis, and hematopoietic stem cell transplantation is not done. We have unfortunately observed it recently uh, in a patient from our core, but we can have a recurrence of this uh, CV autoimmune hepatitis if hematopoietic stem cell transplantation is not done. Um, so uh, here are the three uh, take home messages. Um, first, uh, there is an increased risk of autoimmune diseases in sickle cell disease that has to be known because if we know that it exists, we will, uh, the doctor will look for these specific symptoms and will not always conclude that the symptoms are related to sickle cell disease. The second point is that uh, steroids, glucocorticoids, should not be used or should be used very carefully, uh, at least when they are at medium or high dosages. Uh, transfusion should be considered. It's very important. And the last point is that hydroxyurea and hematopoietic stem cell transplantation can be uh, also a benefit uh, for autoimmune uh, diseases and sickle cell disease. So thank you very much for uh, your attention and I, I would be happy to discuss uh, all the points that you want to discuss. Thank you very much. Dr. Alali for this comprehensive and very clear presentation. I see there is already one question in the chat. Um, also, I would like to, to say before addressing the first question that if you prefer to address the question orally, please raise your hand and um, 
you can unmute yourself and take the floor. So the first question, do these autoimmune disease affect people with sickle cell trait as well in the same ratios? Yes, it's a very good question. There have been um, already uh, reports on this subject and question, but we we are not we not we do not know perfectly well uh, yet. What we know is that in uh, sickle cell trait, uh, we don't have the same hemolysis uh, because the level of hemoglobin uh, S is not the same, of course, and hemolysis is not as important. And hemolysis seem to be very important in the mechanisms leading to uh, autoimmunity. So there might be uh, something with sickle cell threat, but it's not demonstrated and it's clearly not as uh, important as in sickle cell disease. Thank you very much. Maybe we can wait for a few minutes to see if other questions arrive. Of course, I really encourage the audience because this is a unique occasion for speaking directly with uh, an expert of a specific shaped topic. So I said before, you can both write or unmuting yourself and take the floor as you prefer. And yes, I see a new question. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, very enlightening. Are there differences in autoimmune disease diagnosis and the different sickle cell disease phenotypes? Uh, again, a very, very interesting question. Um, it, the, 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 um, the publication, the, the, the literature on uh, autoimmunity in sickle cell disease is um, growing, but it's not uh, still as important as it should be. So I, I cannot answer this question, but I can answer from OCOR because uh, we had a look at this uh, question and um, uh, clearly uh, autoimmune uh, diseases in our court uh, concern patients with uh, SS um, phenotypes. But um, as we have uh, really a majority of patients with SS phenotypes, I cannot affirm that it's, um, it's less prevalent in patients with SC phenotypes, for instance. But in my opinion, uh, due to the importance of hemolysis, as hemolysis is less important in patients with SC or s beta plus uh, phenotype, uh, I think that autoimmunity, it's my impression, is uh, that patients with these phenotypes are less prone to autoimmunity, but it's not demonstrated. And uh, it would be interesting to do it in a, a multi-centric uh, uh, study uh, to answer this uh, very question, interesting question. Thank you very much. I pass to the other question. Um, thank you for the presentation. Do you recommend annual screening of asymptomatic sickle cell patients with uh, autoantibodies, asymptomatic for autoimmunity clinical symptoms? No, I wouldn't do so because as we have seen some, um, as autoimmunity is, is very uh, prevalent, uh, you can have uh, biological markers of auto or immunological markers of autoimmunity um, without having uh, the disease. And having this, um, um, I don't know, for instance, anti-nuclear antibody half of the patient, uh, to know that you have this uh, increased uh, uh, markers, it will not, lead you to change uh, your uh, therapeutic um, uh, strategies uh, because it's very important to, to first look at the symptoms and look at the clinic. So uh, I would say that the, the doctors should um, do this uh, um, investigation very easily, but not when patient, in my opinion, when not when patient is asymptomatic because it will not lead to introduction of uh, steroids or uh, immunomodulatory uh, treatments or, or other uh, therapy. But it's, it's, uh, your, 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 your question is uh, relevant and uh, it's true that in the general population, when, for, when you find a marker that uh, has been looked for for uh, sometimes a wrong reason and you find that it's uh, high, an immunological marker, you will be more careful. So uh, it's not... Um, 
I wouldn't advise it, but we have to take it uh, into account when uh, when we are uh, in front of this uh, positive autoimmune uh, biological uh, markers. Thank you very much. So right now there are no questions, but of course we can wait again some minutes to see if they pop up, because we have some we have still some moment to spend together with this topic. Eric, here it goes. Any difference between HU versus red blood cell exchange in the apparition of autoimmune diseases? Um, I cannot answer the question <laughs> because I do not have the information and um, I haven't found this information in the literature. Uh, but it's a very interesting point. And again, uh, a very large study with many centers could help answer the question. Um, I think that red blood cell exchange will lower the hemoglobin S level, but there are still many uh, red blood cells, or well, at least I, I would say 30% of the red blood cells that are uh, sickle uh, red blood cells and that contain a majority of hemoglobin S. So there, there is still hemolysis, there is still activation of the endothelium. It has been well demonstrated, there's still adhesion, there's still inflammation. So uh, uh, I don't see why it would, it would prevent the occurrence of uh, these diseases. And uh, another point is that in some centers and uh, um, patients with um, under monthly uh, transfusion program, they are uh, also uh, treated with hydroxyurea in order to um, improve uh, this adhesion uh, issue. And this um, will make uh, the question more difficult to answer. But uh, in a retrospective uh, multicentric uh, study, I I'm sure we could uh, have a, um, an answer. Thank you very much. As said, we wait two minutes to see if there are any questions. So while waiting, maybe I can advertise the new topic that will be after the summer break, the 27th, 26th of September. And there will be a lecture from Celeste Bento. He's a laboratory expert from Portugal, University of Coimbra. And she will talk about genetic counseling and embryo selection. So please take note of this day if you are interested also in this topic just after summer break. So I see no new questions arriving. I think we have addressed all the important aspects of the topic. I, I see. Um, ah, there is ah, a new yes, maybe I... yes, no. Um, Okay. <laughs> Hello everyone, I just joined, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, it's uh, I'm completely interested. <laughs> yes, um, by the way, Ida, you could uh, see the video of this webinar when it will be published on our YouTube because all those webinars are gathering in our educational channel on YouTube. And I'm sorry you could not assist, uh, but likely there, there will be the available material for those kind of, I mean, we are not always available, so it's normal, but we can still see the, the video. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Alali, for being with us and for sharing your time and expertise. Thank you very much, it was a pleasure. Anna, there is one question. Um, is it normal that they have difficulty, I think physician, she meant physician difficulty finding other disease when you have sickle cell disease yes i think it's normal because um when you have already a diagnosis um that's what we are teaching to the the, the medical student students um the, the problem is that when you have already the diagnosis or the idea of the diagnosis you can miss uh the real diagnosis, so you can miss many important information. So when a patient comes for pain at the emergency department and uh, that we know that he is affected with sickle cell disease, uh, 
a lot of, of patients or people or doctors, nurses will uh, immediately say it's a vasopathy crisis. And it's, I would say it's a human normal reaction, uh, but it's the wrong way to uh, do medicine because you will miss all the other diagnoses that are very important. So uh, um, it, it's normal, but it's sometimes that we have to fight again. Thank you very much. There is one comment say, thank you, very interesting. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so thanks to all of you for this great debate. Again, thank you, Dr. Alali, for having been with us and shared your expertise. And see you after summer break, uh, the 26th of September. <laughs> thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.